You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is Lecture 4 from the collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Approaching the Mystery of Golgotha. Lecture 4 is entitled The Michael Impulse and the Mystery of Golgotha, Part 2, given in Stuttgart, May 20th, 1913. We have striven to cast a little light on what actually characterizes our present age from the standpoint of universal laws. Let me read that again. We have striven to cast a little light on what actually characterizes our present age from the standpoint of universal laws. We should not pass over this sort of characterization of an age, for the spiritual powers and spiritual impulses of an age are the very forces and impulses at work within each of our souls. Moreover, we cannot establish ourselves on the right footing with our souls if we lack the ability to situate ourselves in relation to these forces and impulses, which in fact are simultaneously the spiritual forces and impulses of our own souls. It is altogether true that just as each of you has established why you believe this or that in spiritual science, there also lives, even if unconsciously, in the souls of those who come to spiritual science in an upright, honorable spirit, a feeling or instinct that comes from the true impulses of our time. The day before yesterday I sought to characterize how we presently live in what one can call the Michael age, in which understanding for spiritual things will continue to become increasingly possible for more and more souls. As the last centuries ran their course, it became possible to understand the objects of natural science and physical, chemical, physiological laws. In a word, everything pertaining to outer space and time. In that Gabriel age, understanding awoke in soul for what marched from triumph to triumph in the natural sciences, inclining them to a scientific understanding of the world. But now we are approaching an age in which it will be just as possible to understand the spiritual Never before in the development of humanity were two successive ages actually so radically different as the one that has just ended and the one we are entering. Souls inclined to the spiritual will seem stranger than ever to the souls who still cling to what earlier centuries brought. It will not be long until those who believe they are standing on the ground of materialistic monism will seem entirely anachronistic to souls who seek with yearning for an understanding of the supersensible worlds. For, since the last third of the previous century, a spiritual tide from the higher worlds has been opening itself to our world, making it possible to obtain understanding for what spiritually leads the evolution of humanity and the world. Almost two thousand years ago, the event familiar to all of you as the mystery of Golgotha took place, which has been discussed and illuminated here from many sides as the major center of gravity of the development of humanity. And it must have become clear that purely from within and it must have become clear that purely from within spiritual science, without a touch of any kind of dogma, the understanding of this event is possible, so that one can expect understanding by every creed of the present day. The reasons why someone will not accept the Christ event as the major centre of gravity in the evolution of humankind have also been thoroughly discussed. However, we should also examine this in relation to the kind of soul I was able to speak of yesterday in the public lecture. Someone, out of prejudice, might have no interest about what transpired in a small country at the beginning of our age. Some people may be unwilling to trouble themselves about what we call the mystery of Golgotha. Let us even assume that it would be natural for a soul to conceive the course of history in such a way that what happened on Golgotha is erased. Let us assume it as an hypothesis. If such a soul observes the development of humankind, it would still find something that particularly characterizes this age. I discussed this yesterday. In the period before the mystery of Golgotha, entirely independent of it, a transition took place. The transition was from the human soul's orientation toward the outer environment to an orientation toward its own intimate nature. At the moment when the mystery of Golgotha intervened, this great transition occurred 
from a life in the external surroundings to a turning inward. All people can feel that, even if they ignore the mystery of Golgotha. Humanity at that time, humanity at that point in time, was at a crossroads. One does not need to mention the mystery of Golgotha even once. One can take other events which will show that previously humanity lived in an externalized state, but that afterward people begin to live in an internalized mode which was imbued with the impulse of the time, with its genius. When a change like that happens, it happens in a way that is prepared for beforehand. I don't wish to resort to the trivial by saying that nature never makes leaps in history. The statement is justified only within certain limits. In a plant, blossoms are also prepared among green leaves, yet isn't that a leaping development nonetheless? So there was a preparation for the event that took place at the time of the mystery of Golgotha, which was a turning point in the development of humanity. But when we immerse ourselves in the teaching and outlook of ancient Hebrew antiquity in the centuries preceding the mystery of Golgotha, it is not only there that we find a spirit, an individual spirit, who prepared for the mystery of Golgotha, namely an entirely new epoch in contrast to what existed in Hebrew spiritual life before then, we find such a spirit of preparation in other regions of the earth too. Certainly in the spirit of Judaism, quite another element is present than existed before. During the sixth century before the mystery of Golgotha, a totally different style of observing the world set in, an entirely new epoch in contrast to what previously existed in Hebrew spiritual life. That reveals itself very clearly to the precisely observing gaze. And even if it emerges here in a special way, because the ancient Hebrew people were indeed formed differently, it is still the same spirit, receiving another expression that we find in Greece. It is the same spirit that predominates during the last centuries before the mystery of Golgotha in Greek philosophy, indeed even in Greek poetry. We find it everywhere. One need only look seriously at spirits like Plato and Aristotle, indeed even Socrates, to see that this turning point was prepared everywhere. Now events of this kind occurring here on earth will be directed and led from within the spiritual world. Before the lightning bolt that we designate as the event of Golgotha occurred in physical life on earth, the earlier leader of evolution sent an emissary, at that time still an emissary of Yahweh, to prepare this lightning bolt. And the spirit who prepared the cultural epoch up to the mystery of Golgotha is the same spirit who is the leader of the cultural epoch just now dawning, the spirit we have named Michael. Just as Michael gives our time its character, so he also gave character to the whole culture that prepared the mystery of Golgotha. The only difference is that at that time the power that sent this Michael from the higher worlds was Yahweh. It was not the same then as it is today, when one can so easily object if one talks about spiritual things, quote, You say a lot about the folk spirit and the time spirit and other spiritual matters, but you say so little about God, unquote. People do not notice why one does not talk about God, because no human concept can actually comprehend this being in which we live, and breathe, and do what we do every day. Here, too, there are opinions that are quite interesting in their way. When I gave a public lecture recently in a city, as has now become so common, questions were offered in response, and a person asked a very clever question. He asked, quote, If we logically understand a thing, because we look at it as an object, because we can walk up to it. While we cannot have an objective image of a thing that we have within us, like an eyeball, because we cannot look at it, how does this relate to the assertion of many mystics that one must step back from God in order to look at him as an object? Unquote. Indeed, many mystics have proposed the statement that one must step back from God in order to stand face to face with him. The question was clever. But it must only be answered by saying, quote, You may step back from God as much as you like, but you remain inside of God nonetheless. You cannot get out of God. Unquote. Much logic is perfectly logical, but it is also myopically logical. In the times when people stood closer to the spiritual, one had still a feeling of reverence for the divine in which we live and weave and are, and which should not always be called by name. For that reason, to avoid speaking the name, the ancient Hebrews used the expression, quote, the face of Yahweh, unquote. 
For human beings, the face is what one turns to the outside, through which one reveals oneself. It is not the whole human being, but we recognize the inner nature of a person from the features of the face. So we are not mistaken to speak of the entire human when we mean the face. Therefore, people in those times called Michael, quote, the face of Yahweh, unquote. They named, rather, Michael, the representative through whom, as in a face turned toward humanity, Yahweh was proclaimed to humankind. In familiar circles as well, one much preferred to name the representative rather than to speak of Yahweh himself. Micaiah was even then regarded as the spiritual regent of the age, as the emissary of Yahweh, as the emissary from whom radiated what was meant to come as an impulse to prepare the event of Golgotha. In the, in, in the interval since then, other beings from the circle of the archangels have had the leadership of the spiritual evolution of humanity. And the being who was the leader, as the mystery of Golgotha was being prepared, is the same being who now once again is sending waves of supersensible life into the sense-bound world. There was a Michael, Michael age back then, and a Michael age is just now beginning. However, there is a powerful difference between the Michael age of the past and ours that is now beginning. It would lead us too far afield today to characterize what understanding the period that has passed by since the previous Michael age and ours would bring to the mystery of Golgotha. There have been deeply introspective souls who, from a more or less heightened need for faith, have gained their relationship to the mystery of Golgotha and its bearer. There have been deeply religious natures since the mystery of Golgotha up to our times. However, the mystery of Golgotha, which, it is true, stands as a real point of departure at the beginning of the recent age, is such that the human soul should not presume to see through it completely, just like that, to understand it. New ages will keep on coming that will continue to deepen human souls, and they will understand better and better what happened in the mystery of Golgotha. The event itself stands as the turning point in human evolution, and understanding of it will continue to increase more and more, and to ripen in the spiritual development of the earth. We cannot inscribe this into our souls deeply enough. Let us once grasp in our mind's eye what actually happened back then in a certain metaphysical abstraction. We have characterized it from various points of view. Now, I want for once to choose a more abstract standpoint, one, however, that has the power to release in our souls, when we allow it to have its effect there, a deep feeling. The conventional view of the world, and also conventional science, studies the things around us. Parenthesis, I have already drawn attention to this subject yesterday in the public lecture, but we want to take another look at it. Parenthesis. When these things are studied, a person learns through ordinary thinking and ordinary science to know the laws of existence in the mineral, plant, animal, and human kingdoms, realms. Excuse me. These laws attain their zenith in an ideal, to understand life. But life itself will not be understood here on earth. Only esotericism can give knowledge of life. External science can never see through life. It would be the most ir irresponsible fantasy to believe that one can at any time see through the laws of life as one can see through the laws of physics or chemistry. It remains an ideal, but it cannot be reached. The physical plane cannot have knowledge of life. Knowledge of life must remain reserved for supersensible knowledge. As impossible as knowledge of life is through the senses, supersensible knowledge of death is equally impossible. There are conditions of dreadful isolation of the consciousness in the spiritual world. There is a temporary immersion, as in a sleep. But there is no death in the higher worlds. Death is impossible in the higher worlds. All beings that we have learned to know as the beings of the higher hierarchies distinguish themselves through the fact that they do not know death, that they do not undergo death. Just as it is correctly said in the Bible that the angels hide their faces before the secret of birth, of becoming human, exactly so must they and all the other higher beings also hide their faces before death. Death is an event that is possible only for the sense world, not for the supersensible. Among all the beings of the higher worlds, only one had to go through death, we can also say willed to, 
and that is the Christ. For that reason he had to descend to earth. For a higher being to accomplish this reality, which was necessary for the development of earth, Christ had to descend from a world in which there is no death into the world in which death exists. If such ideas are at first abstract, we must transform them into a feeling, a sensation. The full understanding of what I have just characterized abstractly will become an object of the evolution of humanity. Today, with a certain simultaneous reverence, humility, and tenderness, we draw near to the secret of the mystery of Golgotha. What then actually happened? It has often been characterized. Christ came down from the supersensible worlds into the world, in which he lives since then, albeit as a secret force, but one that will, however, manifest itself from our century on. He came down from the world in which there is no death into the world of death, and he, this power, united himself with the earth. From being a cosmic power, he became a power of the earth. He went through death to come back to life within the existence of the earth, to exist within the world of the earth. And humanity made an effort in some souls who filled themselves with this impulse to understand him through the centuries. However, as development moved along further in the now ended Gabriel epoch, understanding increasingly receded. And today the situation regarding that understanding is especially bad, precisely among those who should have it. Materialism not only asserts itself in contemporary materialistic science, but it also asserts itself many times over in theology. Real understanding of the Christ impulse has decreased. Excuse me. Real understanding for the Christ impulse has decreased. Materialism has seized souls, has nested itself deeply in souls. In many respects, materialism became the fundamental impulse of the last epoch, which has now run its course. Numerous souls have died and gone through the portals of death with the materialistic cast of mind. To go through the portals of death with the materialistic mentality in such a measure as souls have done in the past epoch could never have taken place in earlier ages. In the time between death and a new birth in the spiritual world, these souls lived as if they knew nothing of the world in which they were living. A being confronted them there. They saw it in their world. They had to see it because that being had united itself with the earth existence, even if at first it ruled invisibly in the earth existence of the senses. And the efforts of these souls who had gone through the portals of death succeeded in driving the Christ, parenthesis, there is no other way for us to say it, parenthesis, out of the spiritual world. Christ had to experience a renewal of the mystery of Golgotha, even if not on the same scale as previously. On Golgotha he underwent death. Now it was an expulsion from his existence in the spiritual world, and thereby the eternal law of the spiritual world was fulfilled in him. What disappears in the spiritual world arises anew in the lower world. If it is possible in the twentieth century for souls to develop to the point of an understanding of the mystery of Golgotha, the possibility originates in the event by which the Christ, through a conspiracy of materialistic souls, was expelled from the spiritual worlds and transferred to the sense-bound world, the world of human beings, so that a new understanding for him could begin in the sense world as well. Thus Christ is united in a still more intimate way with everything that constitutes the destinies of people on earth. Just as at one time one could look up to Yahweh and know that he was the being who sent Michael ahead to prepare in advance what should be carried over from the Yahweh era to the Christian era, so now it is Christ who sends Michael. That Christ sends Michael is what is new and great and we should transform it into a feeling. As one could speak earlier of Yahweh Michael as the leader of the era, we can now speak of Christ Michael. Through his transformation from emissary of Yahweh to emissary of Christ, Michael has been raised to a higher level. He has been elevated from the spirit of a people to the spirit of an age. When we speak about a correct understanding of the Michael impulse in our time, we are talking about a correct understanding of the Christ impulse. Abstract understanding has to do with names, always with names. 
It believes it has something when asks, quote, what sort of a being is Michael, unquote, and wants to know whether he comes from this or that hierarchy. Is he an archangel kind of being? Is he of an archangelic nature with this or that quality? Thus we define it and believe we know what such a being is. I have been asked for definitions many times. It always remains, excuse me, it always reminds me of the battle that took place in a Greek philosophical school about the value of a definition. There was an argument over how to define a human being. They finally came together on the point, quote, a human being is a being that walks on two legs and has no feathers, unquote. There is no denying that these criteria apply to human beings, just as well as do many definitions apply to the concepts one stakes out in this way. On the other hand, the man was right who brought a plucked rooster to the next meeting and asked if it were a human being, since it walked on two legs and had no feathers. That is not how we should speak about Michael, especially if we wish to understand the evolution of humanity, because then we must understand Michael too in his evolution, that he is the same being who set the tone for the preparation of the mystery of Golgotha and now in our time sets the tone for the understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. <clears throat> However, back then he was the spirit of a people. Today he is the spirit of an age. Then he was the emissary of Yahweh. Today he is the emissary of Christ. We are actually speaking about Christ when we speak in this way of Michael and his mission and know that he was the bearer of Yahweh's mission and is now the bearer of Christ's mission. We have been able to follow Michael, a spirit who has risen, so to speak, in order to communicate a new impulse to humanity, who has risen, or is rising, from the rank of the archangels to the rank of Archai, or time spirit. His place was filled by another being who comes later. I have spoken several times here about the evolution that the Buddha has undergone. Those now making childish reservations against us have gotten to work in their impudent way on our concept of the Christ impulse in the world, as if we have ever been one-sided with our exposition of the Christ impulse. We have trained our gaze on universal evolution and characterized what lies beneath evolution from within different impulses. We have done justice to everyone. How often has it been emphasized that for us it is true that the Bodhisattva who was born as Gautama rose up to become Buddha. We have followed his evolution to the point in time when he received his mission on Mars. We have already discussed this here. As long as humanity remains on earth, in the case of each person, however high his or her statue may be, we can always speak of an individuality that leads the person from incarnation to incarnation. The individual direction of human beings lies under the angels, the angel beings. If a person becomes Buddha from Bodhisattva, then his angel is freed, so to speak. It is such angelic beings who rise after the fulfillment of their mission into the realms of the archangelic beings. Therefore, if we truly understand how to look deeper and deeper into what lies behind our sense-bound evolution and supersensible evolution, at one point we actually touch on the elevation of an archangel to the being of an archai and the elevation of an angelic being to an archangelic being. I have not said what I have said to you about the spiritual background of the world in which we stand and in which we wish to place ourselves as anthroposophists so that souls can merely theorize about these things, but rather so that souls can transform what is expressed in words and concepts into feelings. Yes, being an anthroposophist in our day and age means to know how the supersensible world that lies at the foundation of the sense-bound world of human evolution is constituted. To feel oneself in the spiritual world as the physical human feels himself or herself physically in the atmosphere, to feel oneself in the same way in the spiritual world. However, one does not feel oneself in the spiritual world just by repeating the spirit, the spirit, the spirit is in us. Rather, in the same way that we can form a concrete judgment of the earth's atmosphere from cloud formations, humidity and other phenomena, so must we also characterize concretely the spiritual world into which we dive every night when we go to sleep and feel what lives and acts in this spiritual world. What is happening today is happening because of the mission that has been handed over to Michael from the Christ, a mission handed down to the same archangelic spirit and by the impulse of Yahweh, once used in the preparation of the mystery of Golgotha. 
It is what is being played out behind our physical sense-bound evolution, and to know oneself within it, to feel in the midst of such a process in the spiritual world as we feel ourselves physically in the atmosphere that we inhale and exhale, means today to have the right consciousness in relation to the spiritual world in a concrete sense. Try in an all-inclusive soul feeling to transform these results of esotericism. Try to gain a feeling concept of what I am trying to place in your souls. Try to pay attention to what it means, particularly in this era, to live consciously within what is occurring spiritually around us and within us, where our souls go every evening when we go to sleep and whither we come every morning when we awake. Just try to guide the soul upward in this concrete entity, often thoroughly abstractly called divine providence. That is in the character of our time. That what bygone peoples could feel only vaguely as providence flowing through the world, we can now recognize and feel as individual beings. Make it stand as an image before your souls that the bygone age had to find the laws of nature. At that time the laws of nature were good when they were used correctly in the human soul to construct external views of the world. But there is nothing absolutely good and bad in the outer world of Maya. In our time natural laws become bad, evil, if they are further used for constructing a worldview in a time when now spiritual life flows into the sense world. These words are not meant for what bygone ages have done, but rather for that which will remain as it was in earlier ages, that which will not put itself in the service of the new revelation. Michael did not fight the dragon in the age that has passed, for at that time the dragon that is meant today was not yet a dragon. It will become a dragon when the concepts and ideas, that are no more than laws of natural science, will be constructed into the worldview of the next age. What will seek to emerge then is correctly understood by the image of the dragon, which must be vanquished by Michael, whose age is beginning in our time. That is an important imagination. Michael defeating the dragon, receiving flowing spiritual life in the sense world. From now on, it is service to Michael. We serve him in the defeat of the dragon. The dragon seeks to produce out of itself the ideas that brought materialism in the previous age and wants to grow materialism further into the future. To overcome, what mean, to overcome that means to stand in the service of Michael, That is the victory of Michael over the dragon. It is once again the ancient image which had another meaning for earlier times but should now receive this meaning for our time. We can know and feel our duty in the image of Michael defeating the dragon when we experience what we should as people of a new age. So let us try to make this image part of our imagination. Let us try to understand our time through knowing that within it We are concretely in the spiritual guidance that is the spiritual guidance of our age, which can be the spiritual guidance of every human soul who uprightly and honorably seeks to develop, to rise to ever higher levels of spiritual life. The end of lecture four.